Um, I am Dennis Longmeyer, the chair of the awards and veto chair lecture series, the committee that oversees that. And before we do get started, I want to remind everybody to please turn off all of your electronic telecommunications devices or put them on silent. And just to remind you of the protocol, if you get a phone call, leave the room before you take it. Don't engage us in your conversation. Sometimes the, the mores associated with this new technology haven't filtered around, but none of us want to hear your conversation with your babysitter or whatever your problem is. Um, and also I want to ask all of you to hold your questions until the end of the lecture, unless Dr. Picaro overrides that. He's the boss, and, and so if he wants you to interrupt him, you're welcome to, but my preference would be to hold your questions until the end. And it, when we do ask questions, when we get to that series, if you will amplify your voices as much as possible asking your question so that some of the question might get picked up on the tape, uh, at least we'll hear that. I've asked Dr. Picaro to also kind of rephrase your question in his answer, but these lecturers always forget to do that, and so I don't want to interrupt him to um, tell him to repeat the question. But if you all will speak real loudly, we'll get a little bit of it on film um, or on, on tape. Also to remind the graduate, the doctoral students that immediately following the formal presentation, brief break and we'll move to the flag room and you all will have a, an hour with Dr. Picaro in an informal colloquium so you can ask him all of the questions that you've been dying to ask him about his career and his trajectory. Um, uh, there will also be a lunch immediately after the informal colloquium. The way the lunch will be organized is after the colloquium, we will go to the cafe and get our lunches and styrofoam plates and stuff and bring them back into the flag room to eat lunch uh, with Dr. Picaro. All of you are welcome to join us. There's a sign-up sheet there. Make sure you sign the sheet so that you don't get charged for it, but that the dean pays for your lunch. Um, it's supposed to be only for graduate students, but we don't check IDs yet. We might start doing that <laughs> today. Um, so everybody is welcome. My primary role here is to introduce you to um, this today's guest lecturer, uh, Dr. Alex Picaro, who is a professor of criminology and criminal justice at the University of Maryland. This is our third and final lecture for this year's series, and I'm happy to announce that we've already identified the first lecturer for next year's series. Um, mark your calendars so that on September 19th, uh, Dr. Doris McKenzie will be visiting us and presenting her lecture. Dr. Doris McKenzie is also from the University of Maryland, and the fact that that's my alma mater doesn't influence <laughs> my decisions in any of these um, invitations, but you will also be thrilled with Dr. McKenzie's lecture as well. Um, most of you are familiar with the Beto Chair Lecture Series. If you're not, please go to the website online uh, on our, at our webpage and not only read the history of the lecture series, but also you can view the videos that are available from previous lectures. And for those of you who are teaching, integrate them into your classes and um, encourage students to, uh, undergraduates and graduate students alike, to enjoy the information that's been presented to us in previous lectures. Um, we've had over 75 scholars from around the world who have participated in the lecture series over time. And today we're going to be adding another um, scholar's name to the list, Alex Picaro. Uh, Dr. Picaro began his educational experiences, higher educational experiences in 1988 at the University of Maryland, where he initially wanted to major in radio, television, and film because he wanted to be a disc jockey. That was when records were still records. Uh, he wasn't going to be a mix master, but a disc jockey. <laughs> Uh, shortly after starting his studies there, he took an introduction to criminal justice class from a doctoral teaching assistant named Ruth Triplett, who subsequently came here and is a former faculty member of ours. And um, she piqued his interest enough and his intellectual curiosity enough to have him reconsider his major, ultimately changing his life's goals and uh, becoming a professor of criminal justice. He completed his Master of Arts and PhD degrees also at the University of Maryland, in spite of all of the conventional wisdom that you should move away from your primary university. Um, he, has, he is the exception that proves the rule um, and has had an extraordinarily strong, successful career since finishing his PhD. 
He completed his PhD in 1996, immediately joining the faculty at Temple University, where, among other accomplishments, he mentored a young up-and-coming student there named Brian Lawton, and I'm sure you're familiar with his name if you've been around here very long. Um, prior to, immediately after that, he moved to Northeastern University and the University of Florida, and then the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. While at the University of Florida, he worked his way through all of the academic ranks, ultimately being appointed as the prestigious Magid Term Professorship uh, before becoming a presidential scholar at the John Jay College. After 20 years of academic wanderings, he returned to the University of Maryland and is a full professor there and also a faculty associate at their uh, Population Research Center. Um, he has, professor Picaro has served on numerous editorial boards and has been a reviewer for virtually every major journal in the discipline of criminal justice and criminology. He's published over a hundred, if not hundreds, of articles, many of which are co-authored by scholars in the field, including former Beto chair professors. And so he's wandering in good company during those wanderings. He is a member of a number of learned and high impact advisory groups associated, associated with criminal justice, including the National Academy of Sciences panel reviewing the research portfolio of the National Institute of Justice. He is an advisory board member of the Ford Foundation's National Immigration Study. He is a member of the MacArthur Foundation Research Team on Models for Change Initiative, and he serves as a senior research fellow at the Police Foundation. He is by far one of the leading research scholars in our discipline, and I'm certain that his presentation today is going to go over well, because I visited the site associated with him at Rate My Professor. If you haven't been there, go. Don't rate me, don't look at what's said about me, unless you want a good juxtaposition of what Maryland can do to you. Uh -huh. um, he s receives an overall 4.9 on their rating scale, which is a scale from one to five, and um, he got a six on the scale for hotness. Uh -huh. I'm not sure how you do that, but... Um, My wife did it. <laughs> The comments posted there include things such as awesome teacher, very passionate about teaching this subject, best professor in the department, makes class interesting and fun, contributes a lot to the field and, and is great to talk about anything, and finally, way cool. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming today's distinguished lecturer, Dr. Alex Picaro. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, uh, everybody, for making some time today and uh, on April Fool's Day, which I I'm still can't believe I'm here on April Fool's Day. Um, but looking through the list of, of the past Beto lectures and, and looking at and watching every single one online, it's, it's beyond uh, humbling and honoring to be among this, this list of people who I read as grad student and who I looked up to in my career and try to learn from. So it's, uh, it's really neat to finally come to Huntsville be with a lot of friends and, uh, and colleagues and, uh, and in an hour and a half hang out with the grad students and find out what's really going on at, at Sam Houston State University. So thank you very much. I'll apologize ahead of time for violating the number of words per slide, um, which I do all the time when I create PowerPoints, even though I never use them. So I apologize. I'm, I'm very new at this. I just kind of like to talk. So, and I like to walk around. So the camera guy will be walking around with me a bit. and. Uh, and then just plow through and we'll go from there. So uh, when I was asked to do this, I sent Dennis, uh, Professor Longmire, several different topical ideas. I said, I could do this one, I could do this one, I could do this one. Which one do you think would go over the best? And I said, I promise not to, to write lambda on the board. I promise not to do any equations. I promise to tell a story. And so the story I wanted to tell is a story about theory and policy which is always you know, the, how, how we do research, never one or the other. It's always integrated in both. And a couple of things here and there. So today's topic is something that we're, we're, we're terming differential deterrence. And we're studying the heterogeneity or the variation that exists in perceptual deterrence among serious juvenile offenders. So we start with this little comic. And it's a comic, so ju just don't take it seriously. That's what a comic is. And this is how deterrence works, right? Uh, Purvis and Annabelle discuss their next crime. What do you think, liquor store hold up or tri-state kill spree? Research time. 
I've created a spreadsheet that calculates our odds of capture in prison terms if caught. Will you be tried as an adult or juvenile? Are we going to cross state lines? If so, which states? What are your chances of facing a liberal judge? Do the jurisdictions have mandatory sentencing guidelines? How long will appeals stave off executions? There, all we have to do is wait for the data to download and process a recommendation. Well, put away your gun, Purvis. We've just been accepted to law school. <laughs> and, you know, the whole idea here is how we make decisions. And we try to input a lot of information. We're not perfect processors of information. And then we do the best we can, but we're constantly making changes in the way we make decisions. And we're constantly making changes in the way uh, in what we're going to have for certain kinds of decisions. So that's the context within which uh, we're operating. So what's the background? And the background here is classic deterrence theory. It's the, it's the forming of our criminal law in the United States of America and a lot of other countries around the world. Deterrence theory, of course, assumes three-pronged approach, certainty, celerity, severity. It assumes that punishment deters subsequent offending uh, and uh, has uh, several different extensions that people have addressed. Uh, the deterrence doctrine assumes complete rationality. But we know that people are not completely rational. And one of the most famous books in, 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 in philosophy was by a fellow named Herbert Simon from Carnegie Mellon called The Models of Man, which talked about our minimal rationality, that we're not perfect processors of information, we don't always have all, have all the information we need to make a decision, and then we, we kind of go with what we got at the time. Uh, so we know that there are limits of rationality. We know that there are a lot of individual differences in how people vary in, in, in their sense of their perceptions of the benefits and costs of doing X, Y, or Z. So for example, the benefit of having another glass of wine, the benefit of having a piece of cheesecake. Well, there's also a cost to each of those kinds of things. And so we, we, we vary in those, in those decision-making components. There's also the importance of informal sanctions. You know, not the sanctions that come from the formal criminal justice system, but the sanctions that we might perceive other people around us, our friends, our family, our neighbors, our teachers, our colleagues. And finally, the manner in which the delivery of sanctions are perceived to be unfair. A lot of people don't like being punished so long as that they think it's being done fairly. So two people are driving down the highway, you're going 80 miles an hour, someone goes 90, but you get pulled over. Right? Why me? And then how the officer deals with you. People who get the, the sanction delivered fairly are more likely to be compliant with the law. So we learn those kinds of things, these four things, uh, based upon a lot of research uh, that have moved uh, along or ahead of the, the formal deterrence com component. There's a long and rich body of empirical research on deterrence theory, largely based on samples of non-serious offenders. A lot, it, it has been caught under the rubric of the science of sophomores because a lot of what we know in, 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 in criminology is based on people we can get data for, which are high school students, college students, and, and that's all fine, but there are a lot of limitations to that. Okay? The evidence shows that sanction threat perceptions are very weakly related to criminal activity, and the effect is largely due to the certainty of punishment. And the certainty of punishment has seen, received the most research because in his original book, and On Crimes and Punishment, Beccaria said, see to it that men fear the laws and nothing else. So the idea is certainty. If I believe I'm going to get caught, then I'm less likely to get caught. And so that's where a lot of the attention has always been in terms of deterrence theory and in terms of criminal justice uh, uh, prevention efforts. But there have been two important limitations as a result of this. The first one is, there's been a lack of attention to the changes in perceptions with respect to offending. So in other words, how do I get to be where I am with respect to what I believe is the likelihood that I'm going to get caught? How does that perception form and how does it change if it does change? Because the formal criminal justice process assumes that when you get punished, you're going to update or you're going to increase your perceived likelihood of being caught. If that doesn't happen, then something's wrong. It's misfiring in some capacity. The second is that there's been a lack of analyses using active offenders, which might be the most relevant group that you're interested in. These are the people who have just shown you they've broken the law. You are punishing them, and you want to make sure that they don't offend in the future. 
So one way you do that as a result of punishment, if the theory is correct, is that they will change or alter what they believe the likelihood of sanctions are. They're going to increase their perceived likelihood of getting caught, and they're going to lower their perceived benefits from offending. If the theory holds water, that's what we should see. So insights about perception changes among serious offenders is even more important, especially younger offenders. Because the idea is if we can catch them early, everybody knows this, if we can catch them early, we can reorient their paths, and we can make them go from one direction onto another. And we know that for a lot of kids, their first offense is their last. And we know for kids who get a second offense, a bunch of them don't go on to do a third. And then there's a small percentage of people who continue making very bad choices throughout their lives. Okay? And we're not very good at predicting who those people are or who they're going to be. Okay? So that's where we are. That's where the limitations are in the extant research. And of course, what our study tries to do is do just that, is try to improve in a small little way uh, in these areas of research. So our main question here is do institutional environments, i.e. placement, does placement alter perceptions? Uh, the current study is unique because it uses data on serious youthful offenders. So we're tracking, and I'll talk about the sample in a lot more detail in a second, we're tracking a real big sample of really hardcore kids as they move out of adolescence and into adulthood. So there's an important transition that's been, it's been a big focus in America in a lot of disciplines and in terms of research dollars. To give you the findings, if you want to tune out now for the rest of the talk, uh, to give you the finding right now, we find what's called a positive placement effect, which means that placement is associated with lower risk and cost and higher reward perceptions, which is counterintuitive to deterrence. Because if deterrence is right, the people who go into facilities should end up having higher perceived risk and lower benefits, but we find the inverse. And we think we find the inverse because there's a selection effect, that the people you're putting into prison, there's something different about them than the people who don't go into prison, i.e. the selection effect. When you deal with selection, a slightly different picture emerges. So here's the context. Is there variation among serious juvenile offenders in the perceived risk, costs, and rewards of crime? Are these differences meaningful in a policy sense? Explore the perceptions of risk, costs, and rewards of offending and assess that variation that exists as a function of prior offending. And I have graphs, nice pictures to show you what we mean. But the idea is that given people differ in how much they offend, do they subsequently have different perceptions of the risk, costs, and the rewards going forward in their lives? We explore how this varies over time across a large group of people. And I could do a very simple experiment in this room to understand the variation that exists. If I would ask everybody in this room what their favorite beer is, I would get Miller Lite, I would get uh, Amstel Light, I would get Budweiser, I'd get a lot of different things, a lot of variation. The same thing is true with our variation in our perceived likelihood of getting caught for any kind of crime. Now if I had just gotten caught, I might have a higher risk of detection than I had gotten caught 10 years ago. And that changes over time, not only within persons, but also between persons. And so that's what we're interested in studying. That process among serious juvenile offenders who get caught and processed in the system, and then how do they go off down the road throughout their lives? Research questions. Does the accumulation of offending provide a basis to which delineate offenders in terms of how they different elements enter into a rational choice calculus? This is all the rational choice theory. Does crime have its own rewards? Does it pay? Does it pay not just in terms of tangible dollars, but in the sense of a thrill or rush that one gets from criminal offending? So here's the data set. This is a pretty interesting little study that we have going on that we were lucky to, to be a part of. This is called the Research to Pathways to Desistance Study. And I've got to give you a little bit of a background because this study um, was born in a Philadelphia U.S. Airways Club conference center. So how did this happen, Alex? Well, this is how it happened. I was part of a MacArthur Foundation research network on adolescent development and juvenile justice. 
And MacArthur Foundation brought together a set of interdisciplinary scholars, psychologists, sociologists, criminologists, uh, lawyers, Frank Zimmern was on it, Jeff Fagan was on it, myself, et cetera, et cetera. We were all brought together as, as to study questions about adolescent brain development and whether or not 16-year-olds really have rational capability compared to 21-year-olds. And we all know that plenty of 21-year-olds have none, and a lot of 16-year-olds have more, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we get this phone call, and they want to have a meeting, and they say, we want you to design a study. And once you design a study so we can understand what serious offenders do, juveniles, when they're kids, and how they transition out of adolescence, and whether or not they are life course criminals. Okay? And they said, and money is not really that big of an option. So, do we just have this phone call? You know, this is not a $100,000 grant. This, this project runs at about a million and a half a year, and you'll understand why in a, in a few minutes. So, we create, the, we create a study. And like every smart academic, or not, um, we, we, we create a three hour interview and try to collect every single thing on the sun, and after we get through the first part of the project, we realize, oh, should have collected that. But the interesting part of our project is we have a, our network also had a, a team of practitioners and people working in the real world who were advisors. So we had people from the Juvenile Law Center, we had judges, we had people from corrections who were part of the entire research process from the design of the study to the actual implementation of the study, and we go over uh, results with them all the time. Because the idea is our research is great, but if our research isn't at least being talked about in the real world, it's just going to sit in, in, a, in a library, and that's just the way it is. And there, as everybody knows, there's always a tension between research and policy. And we're not naive enough to realize that we're not going to make different policies, but if we can inform a debate, that's better than having some information, better than having no information. So that's the study. The study is a two-site study. We're doing it in Philadelphia and in Phoenix. So why Philadelphia? Why Phoenix? Well, because they have very really good record-keeping systems. And the jurisdictions in the Department of Corrections for the juveniles said, yes, we can do their study there. So that's a big part of the reason why we ended up doing the study there. Uh, plus, a lot of us are based in Philadelphia or the East Coast, and a lot of us are based in Arizona or in California, so it makes data collection a lot easier. So we're tracking uh, about 1,500 offenders, give or take. Uh, in today's study, I'm going to talk about 1,100. Uh, and these are all um, uh, people who are not waived to adult court. The sample's primarily male. Uh, and there was this always been this talk about, well, there's a lot of female offenders now all over. We didn't see that in Philadelphia and Phoenix. In fact, we got to a point where we, tried, we had to get every single woman into the study. They just weren't being processed into the system the way people thought they were being processed into the system. And we tried. And they weren't, in, unless those two cities are atypical, and I can't imagine that they're that atypical, we weren't seeing a lot of women circulate through the system. Uh, we followed them at this time that I'm reporting on for data collection for 36 months, and they're followed for every six months. So every six months, these kids doing a three-hour interview. Whether they are in prison, whether they are in Mexico, whether they are in Montana, whether they are in Wisconsin, whether they are in Michigan, whether they are in Manitoba, wherever it is they are, we're tracking them. So we have a great army of graduate students and research staff, and we have a lot of money to send people on planes, trains, and automobiles, and we get them to get the data. And we're paying these kids to also, do, uh, to also uh, collect the, uh, the interview from them. Primarily African American, but we have a good sized Hispanic population, and that was because of the addition of Phoenix. Philadelphia is pretty much a African-American white criminal justice system. Phoenix is very diverse. Uh, so we get a, a large sample of Hispanics there, which is really helpful, uh, predominantly a male sample. So we get them at what we call baseline. So we get them into the study. They are asked to enroll in the study. And then they, they are in the queue. And then every six months on the clock, they get re-interviewed. Right? So that's the, that's the way the data are set up to give you an example of the timing of it all. And we give them a three-hour interview that's about this big on the computer. So there's no, there's no filling out of surveys. We kind of, for serious personal questions, we tilt the computer to them. They type in certain answers. But for other things like, you know, what's your favorite football team, you know, just to kind of break up the interview, that happens throughout. So we ask several measures that I'm going to talk about today to deal specifically with rational choice. 
and how rational choice is being made by, student, uh, by uh, offenders. One is the certainty of punishment, and I'll talk about these. The second one is the social cost of crime, and the third one are the personal rewards that we draw from crime. So these are the measures. To give you an example of what it is we do. I like to give all, I believe all information should be free. And so I like to give you everything, and then you can see and pick it all apart. Uh, this is a standard certainty of punishment item. Everybody who's read anything in deterrence theory has seen this for 30 years. Uh, we ask everybody, how likely is it you'll be caught and arrested for the following crimes? We do seven crime types. They range from serious to not so serious and standard zero to 10 uh, scaling option. Pretty standard measure. So it's repeated seven times. The social cost is asking the following question. If the police catch me doing something that breaks the law, how likely is it that the following people would get upset at me? So we ask about school, friends, family members, neighbors, girlfriend, boyfriend, and it makes me harder to find a job. And the reason why we're doing this informal sanction is because there's a lot of research that came out in the 80s and 90s in criminology that showed that formal sanctions were not that important, but that people didn't they, they refrain from crime because they were worried about their close friends thought or what their parents might think or what their spouse might think. So we thought it would be useful to track these kinds of costs among serious offenders. And then the fun item. We ask everybody, this is kind of a, a, an interesting little item, but it always works out really nice. Uh, how much of a thrill or rush is it for you to do any of the following things? I get no fun or kick at all to I get a great deal of fun or kick at all by doing these things. And a lot of kids, like a lot of adults, love doing this stuff. Uh, and it's more than just the money that they get from crime, it's the fun of doing it. And, you know, there's a reason why you know, it's exciting to kind of almost get caught doing certain kinds of things. And so we ask those as to measure the rewards of crime that are independent from money or, or anything like that. So these are traditional deterrence, rational choice measures. So we explore the perception heterogeneity. Now, like any methodologist in the room, you can analyze data a gazillion different ways. You can run a lot of different models. You can create a lot of different coding categories. And we can talk about that for four hours. I'm going to show you the one we did, and then why we did it. And then I can talk to you about all of the supplemental analyses that we did or show up in footnotes in every single person's article. We divide the sample into thirds. At baseline, so this is when they first get the initial interview, we take the sample and drop them into thirds. So think about 100%, bottom third, top third, middle third. That other .001 is somewhere else. All right. So we, we take the standard self-reported offending frequency scale. This, for those of you in the room who have studied self-reported offending, this is the standard Elliott Heisinga, Thornberry, self-report offending scale. Ask people about the number of times they've done X, Y, and Z. There's 22 items in our scale um, at baseline over the past year. So we're measuring, when they get into the study, what they've done that first, in that past year. All right? And at baseline, they range between 14 and 18 years old. Give an example. Okay? We split them into high, medium, and low. High frequency guys, medium frequency, low frequency. The idea here is to create types so we can anchor the sample. We got the high frequency people, the medium frequency people, the low frequency people, and then what happens to them going forward? So we wanted to stratify the sample to see if the sample was, was heterogeneous or, the, or if there was variation. Just like if I would ask everybody here, how many times in your life have you been arrested? I'd get some zeros, I'd get some ones, and then I'd get like the two pluses. All right, same kind of setup. We just divide the sample. I don't need a show of hands yet. I know some people already. All right, so that's what we end up doing in terms of that. So here are the pictures. And I, I love pictures. I'm, all I do now is draw figures and pictures because I think they communicate information very easily. And so this is at baseline. Now this is not going forward. This is just how does a sample look with respect to offending and their perceptions when you first interview them. Okay, and what we see here, I don't know, I don't think I have a light, no. Do I have a light? No. What we see here is these are the high crime offenders. You can see for them, their average risk is 42%. When I translate it into a percentage, the low risk people have a higher risk. So intuitively that makes sense. The people who are offending at a low amount 
have a higher perceived risk of crime, which is what you should expect. So this is kind of like internal consistency means, okay, it's good that we're getting these kinds of patterns because this is what we should get. And then the high frequency people have lower perceptions of being caught. Again, it's what you'd expect. But what's also interesting here is where people are bunching up. And that's what's neat about this figure. The people who are high frequency are bunching up here to low risk. And the people who have uh, low crime offending, they're bunching up and it's, it's, I have a lot more risk in terms of getting caught. So this is just showing you that the data at baseline are internally consistent. We do the same thing for benefit. The high people on the left hand side again are bunched up in a lot of personal rewards and the low benefit people have lower personal rewards. But look at the height of the bars. It took me a while to create that, but it was really cool to see it. The height of the bar is 0.4 at the beginning for the high crime people. There's more benefit for those people, right? which is what you'd expect. The people who are doing a lot more crime are perceiving a lot more benefit from doing crime, and the people who are doing low crime are perceiving a lot less benefit. We do it for social costs. This is the informal cost, you know, my friends, family, neighbors. There's not that much of action here. They're slightly different, but the story is in the perceived risk of formal detection, of being caught and arrested, and the perceived reward. But I wanted to show you everything so you get to see. That's all fine and dandy. And so these are the, these are the risk of the means, and the idea here is it's to show you the following. And I'll translate in, in this to a percentage. These are the three groups at baseline, okay? High offending people, low offending people, the medium people. So the way you interpret this is, let's just look at the perceived risk and I'll give you the example. The low people have a 7% higher perceived risk of getting caught than the medium people, which is what you'd expect. The high offending people have a 13% less likelihood of being caught in terms of their perception compared to the medium people. So that gives you, in terms of how to interpret that numerical number. But again, it's internally consistent. What you would expect to see. High frequency of people, high frequency offenders, less likely to believe that they're going to get caught. Now here's the, the big question. How does this change over time? So what we do here, now these are, the, these are the observations. Every six months for 36 months. So we anchored them already. And this is them now going forward. So this is the second interview, okay, after the baseline interview. The yellow is the low group, the purple is the medium group, and the blue is the high group. It's the high frequency, medium frequency, low frequency. And this is like forest, you know, is, is the cup half full or half empty? So you can look at the forest or you can look at the trees. So there's two ways I would look at this graph. The first thing I would look at this graph is the risk perceptions don't change much for the low group. There's a ceiling. They are already high in terms of the, they believe that the likelihood of being caught is high and they stay high. There's not much fluctuation with those people. There's a little bit more movement with the high offending people, which is that low bar, but even then they don't have across any of the other two groups. So the high, they might have a floor of their perception, and other people might have a ceiling. So there may be people who are less deterrable, and other people who are more deterrable, and some people who are not deterrable at all. Okay? So, watch the next graph. This is the perceived benefit. Now this one's really interesting, because over time, people are perceiving less benefit of, their offend, of perceptions of offending over time. So that, that reward is getting lower as people are getting older. And that's an interesting little finding. Never been shown in the literature before. Whether or not it means anything, I don't know, but it's kind of neat because no one's ever shown this. So here an interesting little thing happens. There is a, a, a floor here. The low people have low perceived benefit at wave one and then Three years later, they're basically at the exact same spot. They don't move. The action is here. So we can still see variation among serious juvenile offenders. Even the high frequency juvenile offender does alter his or her perception over time. So there is action. You can make changes 
among serious juvenile offenders in their perceptions. Now, whether or not those perceptions alter behavior, that's a different set of questions. But we can alter that. The perceived cost, this is now the, uh, the informal sanctions by friends, families, etc. The high group has very low perceptions of informal sanctions. And they stay pretty much there throughout. There's a, a, a bit of a blip and then kind of goes flat. The low group, the low frequency offender, again, not much action. Okay? So the, all the action seems to be with perceived costs and the action seems to be with perceived rewards. There seems to be floor and ceiling effects for perceived risk. Once you have a high perception of being caught, you have a high perception of being caught. Once you have a low perception of being caught, you have a low perception of being caught. But the rewards is where the action is. Is that even among the high frequency offenders, they start to perceive the rewards of crime lower with time for the high frequency people. The low frequency offenders, they never had a high reward to begin with. It's always the same, it's low. So these patterns all constitute important policy findings, we would argue, at least when we've given this talk and we shared it with the, with the policy advisors we have on our panel, um, they all think it was pretty interesting. Uh, it appears that each of the elements of the rational choice calculus is tending in the expected direction of being less likely for crime to appear rational as age increases. So people are cognitively changing their perceptions associated with the law and the system. They are changing. There is variation in the perceptions of the risks and the rewards, so we have an ability, the system does have an ability to alter this, contrary to popular opinion. Okay? Over time, the risks and the, uh, the costs rise, the rewards fall for all groups, but where the perceptions are anchored at baseline is critical since the, those, those patterns don't merge, especially for the high and the lows, they don't cross. They stay the same. There's a lot of difference in the rank of those two groups over time. High type of offenders who perceive low risk and costs and high reward, even for them over time, they never adjust to the baseline level of the low guys. So when you're a high rate offender, it's going to be very hard to get you to be where the low offender is in terms of your perception. You can change them, but it's very hard to get at that level. Okay? What's the takeaway message? What does all this mean? Why do we care? There is significant variation in sanction threats generally and across different types of offenders. The bottom line here is you can't treat all offenders the same. A lot of people believe, if you, when you do these public opinion polls, right, and you give, and you give random samples of adults, you know, do you support the death penalty? Everybody gives an answer. But then when you dig into details, you get different kinds of answers. Same kind of thing we would argue here is when you ask people about serious juvenile offenders, they have an image in their mind. But that image doesn't hold true for every serious juvenile offender. All right? Because a lot of them don't go on to have lifetimes of crime. A lot of them, you know, mess up, they have a foray, they get punished, and they stop. But there's a perception that exists among the public, as everybody knows, that every, they're all the same. They're all the same when in fact the data show that that is not true at all. These differences are likely due to the amount of prior information on offending. We think that there's a potential ceiling effect. So once you're high, you're high, and a floor effect. Once you're on a floor, you're on the floor, and it's really hard to move you. Certain types of offenders may be more amenable to sanction threats than others. In other words, some people are deterrable. Other people are just not deterrable. And the key is to find the people who you can change. How do you find them is a very difficult question. Right? We are very bad predictors of human behaviors, like predicting the weather. I remember going up in the mid-Atlantic when there was going to be a snowstorm tomorrow. And the weather person at night said, it's going to have 85 inches of snow. And you wake up the next morning, and there's no snow on the ground, and you haven't examined 45 minutes. All right? we're, we're even worse at predicting human behavior. Everybody knows our risk and actuarial scales, our prediction instruments. They're not good. And we're constantly weighing false positives, false negatives, and, and the consequences of those. The, the classic Packer model of due process and crime control. You know, wh wh when are the decisions are going to be good? When are the decisions going to be bad? 
right? And it's a very difficult thing because people have a lot of very strong points of view on that, and oftentimes they're not based on research findings, which is never, never really a good thing. So what are the policy thoughts? Um, I'm constantly being reminded about the policy implications of my work. And so I always feel the need to talk about them in more detail more than ever. So we've advanced this idea called differential deterrence. And the idea here is that there's variation among juvenile offenders regarding their decision-making calculus. They don't all make decisions in the exact same ways. For those of you who have worked with kids in the system, who have interviewed kids in the system, we've done a lot, we've done a lot of these interviews as well, and you talk to these kids, and, and the, each of them has like their own life course story. And each of them just has a different point of view. Some, some kids you can tell, yeah, a kid, I'll see this kid again in six months in, in a facility. Or other kids you know that something's changed in them, and they just, they did something wrong. And a lot of us have, re, have reoriented paths. I mean, you talk about how you got to be where you are right now. If you had predicted where you were going to be 15 years ago, who, who knew what, what, I thought I was going to spin records. You know, there, there were records, for those of you in the room who don't remember what record is. Uh, there were really cool records, right? That's what I thought I was going to do. But then something happened and took me this way. The same thing is true with a lot of serious offenders. They're not all the same, okay? So there's a ceiling and a floor. It is unrealistic to expect a uniform effect of deterrence among all offenders. But that's how the system treats everybody. It treats them all the same, and it assumes that every kid makes decisions in the exact same way. And we know that that's not true, okay? Repeated experience may affect changes in the perception for certain people, but not others. So where to from here? What's the next step? And we view research, like a lot of people in the room, is you know, th the way I describe it to, to my students is you, you just got a, cross, uh, a jigsaw puzzle, and there's 500 pieces. And your piece is piece one. And then the next study is piece two, and slowly over time you build the puzzle. Okay? So what are we going to do next? We think that, the, that an interesting thing to do is, is to update perceptions. And what I mean by updating is, I'll give you two examples. Uh, Robin Williams made a great movie called The World According to Gart many, many years ago. House gets struck by lightning, right? It's not going to happen again. How can it happen to me twice? And so the same idea occurs with updating. When you commit crime and you get caught, right? You get, you, you, you're going on the highway and you get pulled over by an officer and you get a speeding ticket, right? So you, you fill out your form, you apologize, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then you don't immediately break the law again, right? I mean, you, that would be illogical. But there, so there's a short-term deterrence effect. But then over time, you go back to your old ways, right? That's why a lot of people's diets fail. You know, they, they're really committed, and then they just, they, they just mess up. So people are updating their perceptions. They update the way they live their lives based on information. And we make good information, we, make, we, we use information, we don't always use all the information. Or sometimes we disregard information. Right? See, people know that certain things in life are bad for them, but they do them anyway. Right? Everybody knows that we should exercise. Not everybody exercises. Right? People know that we shouldn't do certain, put certain things in our body, but we still do. Right? And then there's consequences to those behaviors. The question from deterrence theory is that if, if the theory is right, people update the way they think about the world, the way they think about the law. Okay? And so that's one of the things we're looking at going forward is how people do that updating. And do they do the updating? Does that updating vary across sex? Does it vary across age? Does it vary across uh, race? Hasn't been done in the literature, unfortunately. We also have this idea about the rational expectation hypothesis. And this is a great thing about, you, know, you can, the first day of class, you can always ask students, what do you expect to get in this class? You know, nowadays, students expect A's. It's like the, 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 they just expect it. It's like they, they've paid the money to go to school, and, you know, you're the one who failed them. You're the one whose test was unfair. It's your fault. Not their fault. It's your fault. So here's the idea we have. The idea we have is that there might be perceptions of outcomes and the question is, do those perceptions differ from what I expect to happen? Okay? So what do I expect to happen tomorrow? What do I expect to happen next week? What's my perception going to be like 
for that expectation. This, this has its, its role in, in, uh, in public policy and in, in the economics uh, decision-making literature in, in the business world. And people who play the stock market, there's a lot of research on this, uh, about how people think they can actually control the market and, and make decisions about mutual funds and, and stocks and people who play the stock market. And they actually believe that they can control things that are completely not in their control. But they believe it. Okay? So the idea is to link, link perceptions and expectations to future beliefs and actions. And we think there's a subjectivity component to this. And how offenders navigate this world about perceptions and expectations is something we don't know the answer to. We don't know, as scientists or as policymakers, how kids arrive at these decisions about what they expect. What, what, what is the expectation of punishment? If I were to ask a random sample of adults in this room, you get caught today for, for DUI. What do you think your punishment's going to be? A lot of people miscalculate that. They don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. And in fact, there's a lot of very famous studies, even beginning with Zimmer and Hawkins' studies in 1973 in their book, Deterrence, about people don't know what the costs of crime are. They have no idea what the real punishments or penalties. They think they know because they see the, the 4 o'clock news and the first one, this kid did this and got nothing, you know. But that's not how the world works. But that's what they believe. So we think we're going to doing some work in that area. So to tie this all together, what does all this mean? And I think just about everything in life you can learn from Chapter 5 of Alice in Wonderland. Um, disregard the picture, that's not there for any particular reason. So there's this great discussion between the caterpillar and Alice. And I love children's books because everything I read to my nieces and nephews all the time. But this one's great because the caterpillar says, who are you? And this was not an encouraging opening for a conversation. Alice replies rather shyly, I, I hardly know, sir. Um, just at present, at least I know who I was when I got up this morning. But I think I must have changed several times since then. What do you mean by that? Said the caterpillar sternly. Explain yourself. I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir, said Alice, because I'm not myself, you see. I don't see, said the caterpillar. I'm afraid I can't put it more clearly, Alice replied very politely, for I can't understand it to my, myself to begin with. And being so many different sizes in a day is very confusing. And the idea here is that people change. People change from the morning, they change to the afternoon, they change to the evening. And for those of you who are in relationships, you understand how that works. Uh, but the idea, is also, <laughs> the idea is also true with respect to offenders. They change over their lives. They change their perceptions. They change their behaviors. They're not always going to have, when the die is cast, the die is not always cast for everybody equally the same. And that's the lesson we learn from the Alice in Wonderland book, is that there is change. People do change. And show evidence of that. Who changes more than this person here? This is actual photograph of 1990 Barry Bonds, 1998 Barry Bonds. For those of you who are, I'm, I'm an avid baseball card collector and I have Barry Bonds' rookie card and he is very thin in his rookie card. So to give you an example of how Barry Bonds has changed, there's Barry Bonds' life course and then there's Barry Bonds just a few years later. He's changed. Question is, Barry's still looking for work. That hasn't changed in the last two years. So, um, with, <laughs> with that said, I thought I, uh, oh, I was always taught to, give, to keep presentations to no more than uh, a little bit of time because of uh, people's uh, attention spans and stuff. So hopefully that was useful. Hopefully you have some questions, challenges, critiques, suggestions. Um, I'm always in the business of trying to better our work and, and, and go from there. So. Uh, I have to repeat the question because that's what I was instructed to do to get everything on tape, so fire away. And we'll leave that in the background so people can get online and see that this talk was about Darth Vader. <laughs> yeah? During the, uh, the graphs you were showing, it said the perceived rewards go down. And I was just wondering if you collect or if you've noticed, do, the, uh, do they actually correlate with the rest record? Yeah, that's a very good question. The, the question on the floor was, in the graph, we had shown that perceived rewards actually go down over time. And they go down a lot more for the high-frequency offender. 
The question is, is that change in perception associated with changes in their actual behavior, which is the really question we're interested in? And the answer to that is yes. That's a whole other set of studies that we've looked at. And basically what we find is that the effect of rewards diminishes over time, and as people are perceiving less rewards over time, they are offending less over time. The effect is not large, but it is there. It is a meaningful, statistical, significant effect. The rewards of crime uh, always are more strongly related to outcomes than the costs and risks of crime. That's something that's been true in the deterrence literature for 35 some odd years. We're finding it here as well. The thing is that in the deterrence literature, that had never really been done among serious juvenile offenders tracked over time. In fact, we, this is the first study that's ever looked at this question. It's a very difficult sample to follow. In fact, our retention rate's about 92%, which is unheard of in a longitudinal study, but even among this sample, it's even more unheard of, and that's because of the generosity of the foundations and the, uh, the uh, organizations who've been funding the project. It costs over a million dollars a year to run this. So we have an army of, of people who are going out and doing these interviews. So it's, we're really lucky to be in that position. But the, the answer to your question is that's, that's the, uh, the, the main finding that we're getting there. Good question. Because it, none of this stuff, you know, deterrence holds no weight if it doesn't relate to, to actual behavior. And so we, we have done that and we have shown that. Yes? Yeah, that, that, that's a really good question. So the, the, the question on the floor is, is there variability in these perceptions and behaviors over time? So if I understand your question, are you talking about the, basically the confidence intervals? Yeah. Um, oh, for the actual offending, so 36 months where the risk has yes. gone down. Yes, 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 what we have, uh, that's, a, okay, so the question is, how is offending tracking over time in the sample? Right. Um, we have a paper that we, we are, um, that will be published next year that actually looks at the trajectories of offending over time among this sample. And basically what we find is what a lot of other people find is that um, there is a sizable drop in offending as these kids enter adulthood. There's a small percentage of kids who continue offending at a pretty good clip. But the, the, the finding of crime going down, everybody will say, well, yeah, crime goes down. But among a really high rate offending group like these kids are. All these kids got busted for felonies at age 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So these, this is the sample that everybody's concerned about who are gonna be high rate criminal offenders throughout their entire lives. Well, in both self-report and official record follow-ups, now we're at 60, 72 months, the majority of them are not offending by self-report or official records. And they're not locked up and they're, they're not dead and they're not moved away. They're all still doing interviews. So even among a really highly select group of high rate offenders, remember they, they got into the system. So to get into the system, you've had to exhaust a, a lot of opportunities. And so even among a very high rate kid, a uh, high rate offending kid, you know, seven years later, they pretty much stopped. So, and that's, you know, we, we knew that from community samples and high school samples and this, that, and the other, but we really didn't know that among serious juvenile offenders. And so when we, when we show this, you know, some of the people in the room go, well, no, that, that can't be true because all serious offenders are bad and they're bad forever. That's not, that's not true. That's not, what we're find that's not what we're finding among 1,400 kids. Other questions? Challenges, suggestions. Yes. You, you said it was almost like during your presentation when you talked about the decreasing perception of reward uh, that the system, you allude to the system mm -hmm. having an effect. How much of that really is the system having an effect? And how, many of that, how much of that is maturity and experience? Among the that's, the, that's a good question. Uh, the, the question on the, on the floor is, um, the rewards are going down and the costs might be increasing over time for the entire set of sample. And the question is, how much of that can we attribute to age and maturity? How much can we, of that can we attribute to the criminal justice system effects? Those are very good questions. What we find is that the, the, um, the kids who get placed, we find that there's a placement effect. It does, it does influence their perceptions. 
when we look at age differences and maturity, you see if that explains the change, it does not explain the change. So I didn't, I didn't present those analyses today because those are in a, in a regression format, but it, the age and maturity does not explain the change, which is very interesting because the, the conception is with time we get more mature and that our, that's not what we're seeing in, the, in these data. So um, it could be other things that we're not measuring because you know, it's not a random study so we can't measure everything in the world. So there could be other things that are influencing those perception changes over time. We just have not assessed them all. Right now, as the best of our ability, we, we assess exactly just that question because that's, that's the, the critical question as well. They're just getting older. You know, just leave them alone. They're just going to change anyway. Um, but we're not seeing that at all. It's a great question. Yes? That, that's a really good question. Uh, the question on the floor here is um, how much of these changes are influenced do family uh, changes have in their lives, both in terms of their immediate family and probably the families that they start getting into, creating their own families and relationships. And uh, we have several students. One of the good things about this project is we have, we've, uh, have a lot of students doing theses and dissertations on it. We've been very integrated into having students be involved in, in the research study because there's no way we can do everything. And we have several students who are looking at motherhood and fatherhood and how that influences behavior. The answer is we don't know the, uh, how family affects perceptions because we have not looked at that yet. The kids are now, the kids are now starting to have their own kids and starting to get into relationships. So we're doing those studies right now. So five years from now, uh, we'll have hopefully some answers to that question. But we also, we also have a qualitative component to the study as well where some of the offenders, about 30 offenders, are, are being, uh, are given uh, basically life interviews and long interview sessions. And we have a doctoral student at the University of Maryland who's doing her dissertation on that. So there are a lot of little sub-studies that people are carrying out like those kinds of things. We just don't have answers to every single one of those yet. Yes? Right. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. The question is, uh, can you tease out the risk of being caught from the risk of being punished? Or are they one and the same? Um, several famous books and articles in the 60s and 70s talk about the processes of punishment. And uh, there was a great little shoplifting book uh, narrative about uh, just being caught. That, for some people, that's punishment in and of itself, even though you don't get through the system. The way we phrase those deterrence questions, it was caught and arrested. We have a subset of questions as well that we just, we dissect that out. And the effect is, doesn't change when you dissect them out. Um, and, I, and I think that might be a sample issue because all these kids have been caught and arrested. So I think in a, in a, in a, in a different sample, uh, like a community sample or a high school sample, we might tease out a different kind of effect. But in this sample, we don't see the difference in, in that, that at all. That's a great question. Yes? Does perception change by base or it's like The question is, uh, are we seeing uh, perceptions, uh, perception variation across race and ethnicity in the sample? Uh, the answer to your question is, uh, in terms of race, uh, no. That African Americans and whites and when we look at ethnicity and we look at Hispanics, we see very similar perceptions across uh, baseline and thereafter. There's not a lot of differences across the, the race and ethnic groups. Uh, in terms of sex, we have not looked at that yet. Uh, we, at baseline, women have you know, higher perceived risk, lower perceived rewards, and men of the inverse pattern. But we have not looked at that over time. We have a student who's doing that question right now as well. Yes? Yeah, that, that, the question is, are, are we seeing locational differences in risks and rewards uh, between Philadelphia and Phoenix? The answer to that question is no. But interestingly enough, the crime types that the kids are involved in in the two jurisdictions are different. Philadelphia, we, we, we were getting a lot of drug offenders, just tons of drug offenders. In fact, we had to put a cap on the, on the number of drug offenders in the study. Otherwise, it would be a study of drug offenders, basically sellers. 
Um, and so Philadelphia is that the crime pattern is very different from the crime pattern in Phoenix. Uh, and the level of offending is different over time in the types of offending and in the amount of offending. In, in Phoenix, a lot of gang-oriented crime. We also have a whole battery of questions about teasing out gang versus non-gang crimes. A lot of gang crime in Phoenix. Philadelphia, it's not, a, it's not a big phenomenon. At least among these kids, at that time we caught them in the study. Not a very big phenomenon. Um, we have one student who now has, interestingly enough, uh, in Philadelphia, for those of you who've been in both cities, they're, they're very different cities. Uh, Philadelphia is a classic East Coast grid city. What I mean by grid is the way the streets are lined up. Phoenix is, Phoenix is not like a traditional city in a sense. Uh, it's just kind of boom. And in Philadelphia, it's very neighborhood oriented. Phoenix is not very neighborhood. Like Chicago and Baltimore, Boston, they're very neighborhood oriented cities. And so she's doing an analysis where she looks at neighborhoods and how risks vary across neighborhoods. We don't have an answer to that yet. Um, but we know that crime types vary in certain census tracts. Kids are doing certain kinds of crimes over here, but not over here. And that's not just true be because they get picked up in certain spots because they're doing certain kinds of things. There's just different kinds of opportunity structures in different parts of the city to do certain kinds of crimes. So stay tuned um, for the answers to that. Yes? Yes. Right. Do, you think, do you take this as a weakness for the study? And, or in other words, if the samples in 88% of the sample were females rather than males, yep. the, the results would be good? The, 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 it's, it's, it's a really excellent question. The question is, you know, our sample is predominantly male, 88% male and, and the rest female. And the question is, is that going to have a detrimental influence or what kind of results come out of the study, both in terms of theory and policy? Is it, is it a highly select sample? Uh, and as a result of that, will our conclusions be tainted is a too strong a word, but they'll be influenced by the sample. The answer is yes, that they're going to be influenced by the sample composition. To what degree? We, it's hard to say because we don't have a counterfactual to know what, the opposite, what any other pattern would look like. But as I said, when we went into the, into the two systems, we, we, we try to get 50-50 split. And we were not getting women into intake in either of those two systems at all. So we had to get, basically, in, in the six, eight month recruitment period, every female offender who went into the system, we had to take into the study. Because they weren't coming into the, into the study. They, were, they weren't coming into the system. So now again, it, it could be that that was Philadelphia and Phoenix at an odd point in time. I'd, I'd find that hard to believe because there's a perception that well, female crime is exploding and it's going through the roof and the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention created a study group on female offenders and we, we weren't seeing them there. And so the answer is yes, unfortunately, um, but it wasn't by design at all. It was just that's the way that the sample came out, unfortunately. It's great. It's a really great observation. Yes. There's a lot more of assaults and robberies. And there's a lot more of uh, interpersonal violence in, in Phoenix. Oh, the, the question was um, the, the, we know that crime is clustering in different ways across the two cities by crime type, and there's more gang oriented activity in Phoenix than in Philadelphia. Why that might be the case. And what we've been finding when we've started to unpack that is in the Phoenix site, there's a lot more interpersonal pers uh, violent crimes uh, that are group oriented gang fights, assaults, uh, robberies than they are in, in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a lot of burglaries, uh, a lot more trafficking of goods, a lot of drugs, a lot of drug sellers. Um, but that's what we're seeing. The nature of the crime is a little bit different. Alex. Yes? Well, on that point, are you going to or have you started trying to see if there are, for example, specialists 
criminals as opposed to generalists, and whether this there is any significance. Yeah, the the groups? one of the the question is, you know, have we started to dissect the crime type patterns in the sample over time? So is the whole specialization debate in criminology? It's been around ever since Shaw's the Jack Roller. Uh, in the 1930s about whether or not there is a blah offender, whether or not there's a sex offender, whether or not there's a specialist burglary offender. In our stuff that we've been doing so far, these kids are doing everything. They're doing, we have, because we, 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 we look at also a variety of offending scale to see how many different kinds of crime, not just the frequency of each of those 22 crimes, but if we made every one of those basically a, a counter you did one, you did two, you did three, you did four, and we look at that in self-report records and in the official data, we see that these kids are doing all kinds of stuff. They're not just doing, I'm not just selling marijuana. I'm doing this and this and this and this and this and, and this. So it's, it's, it's almost like a lifestyle, almost. Uh, we, in fact, we can't find one, I couldn't find one kid who was a specialist in the data set. And I've, I've been studying the specialization question for a long time. And you know, it's, it's always nice when you keep getting the same finding. Uh, that, that there's more general, there are specialists out there, yeah. But they are not what people think they are. There's very few of them. And they're very hard to predict a priori. I mean, everything's the frequency of offending. These kids are just, they're just rolling the dice. You know, today's dice is going to be these four crimes. Next week's dice are those four crimes. And that's what's happening. At least that's what we're seeing. Other questions, comments? You wowed us. I wowed him. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.